This is a Wild Theology podcast about practices for creative thinking. And it's aimed specifically at writers, but don't be afraid. These aren't things that you have to work real hard at. They are things you can do in everyday life. So writers, ride on. So this podcast is going to take a little bit of a turn from what I usually do in the Wild Theology podcasts. Um, I'm going to be talking about creative writing and specifically coming up with crazy ideas. So this is something that applies to um, sci-fi, fantasy writers, young adult um, fiction writers um, specifically, and and poets. Um, Now at the end of the video, I will apply the same lessons that go for writers and creative thinking to our spirituality and show that how the skills to develop our creativity are positive skills for the development of our spirituality. I think those two things go hand in hand. Um, I suppose Richard Dawkins would agree with me completely since he would look at the spiritual world as a made-up world, but hey, Perhaps there are some things that do go hand in hand with being creative and um, a deep Christian spirituality. So anyway, that'll come at the end of the video. Um, But for right now, I want to talk about developing creativity. And I I need to start by making the point. um, This does not take the place of writing skills and wordsmithing. Those are important things to be studied in and of their own. Um, but the skills of creativity, which I believe are more than just a muse that comes to us in the night or an inspiration that comes from God, but also um, can be a thing that can be practiced. And the practice of it, in a sense, is like working a muscle. Um, And so there's many people who don't feel confident in their creativity, despite the fact they have... Um, great writing skills. So um, I just want to start off with this thought that creativity is not just a flash in the pan. It's not um, uh, the muse that comes by night, a flash of inspiration um, that comes to certain people and not to others. It is those things, but it's not only those things. And creativity can be developed but it's a bit like a muscle. Where did Cervantes find the inspiration for the two parts of Don Quixote, a book that is perhaps only surpassed by the Bible in the number of translations into other languages? Um, Where did Rabelais, with his writing of the five parts of Gargantua and Pantagruel, continually come up with the absurd, grotesque medieval fantasy that made those masterpieces. Shakespeare's inspiration seemed unstoppable. And then we have musicians. Bach wrote so many pieces that have become masterpieces down through the centuries. More recently, people like Paul Simon, and and even more recently, like Sufjan Stevens, seem to be relentlessly creative in their songwriting. And that that includes, for those two, um, lyrically as, as well as musically. Where does this come from? Is it something that just comes to certain people who are skilled, or is it something that uh, we can practice and develop on our own? I'm not going to uh, pretend that some people are not going to be better at it than others. It's That was a double negative, wasn't it? <laughs> but, so, um, some people are more gifted at creative and wild ideas, but for those of us who feel that we're not Well, we can practice these things. And if you think of it as sports or music, you might be able to get a handle on what I mean by this. We talk about playing sports. 
but for the person who is a professional, they work before they play. They work to develop muscle, they work to learn the skills of the sport that they then go on to play. So the play in itself is a lot of work. A musical instrument, we call that playing as well. But the people who are gifted at it are people who have practiced it many times. Um, both of these things are something I know about. Um, swimmer, water polo player, through um, uh, my childhood into um, high school and, and then a little bit in college. I spent a lot of hours in the water before I played the game and did it with any kind of success. The same thing with a musical instrument. I have spent hours and hours striking a single note a thousand times to get the kind of sound that I want, holding a chord in a certain way, in the way I want. Then my guitar playing became more fun and more creative. Um, the same is true for the development of our uh, minds and the mental processes that go into coming up with the crazy ideas that we honor so much in science fiction and fantasy writing. Um, where do people come up with these wild ideas? Where did Tolkien get his thoughts? Where did um, Douglas Adams get his absolutely uh, fantastic and absurd ideas for The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe? Um, well, these are things that you too can practice, and so I want to give you a, um, um, a few ideas on doing that. So just like you, a person can play rugby or play tennis or they can play the guitar or play the hurdy-gurdy and have to practice and work at it in order to be able to play at any skill level, the same thing is true about your creativity. So here are some skills that you can practice in order to become more creative. Of course, we know one of the most important things about inspiration is whiskey. Well, actually, it's like 1.30 in the afternoon, and um, this is tea, but it's... Okay, if, if it was um, product placement here, I would be promoting the nation of Wales with that really cool... Um, Welsh uh, shot glass, and I'd be promoting Pandaren whiskey, which is awesome. But but right now this is PG Tips tea, and I'm being silly. So let's move on. So I have three points that I want to suggest that are practice tools for developing uh, wild creativity. Um, so. Point number one, act like a child. <laughs> this is far more of a discipline to me than most people would imagine. Um, there are a couple things that children do that I think ought to follow us into our adulthood. And the first one is play. Now, there's something wonderful about play that develops creativity. First of all, if you're playful, you probably have stories to tell. Because when you played, something crazy happened, and when something crazy happened, it gave you a story. So play, play, play. Get down with children when you're with them and be on the floor and play make dinosaur noises with their toys and car noises with the boys and read the books and use crazy voices to talk to them when you're reading the book. Get down at their level. Do the same thing with animals. There's something that happens when you meet a dog that is not quite sure about you. Of course, as I want to give a caveat about this. If a dog looks like it wants to bite you, don't do this. But some dogs can be a little shy. But if you bring yourself down to their level, even your head, perhaps below their head, 
in the case of greyhounds particularly, they can be quite shy, you bring your head down lower, there's something about that move that makes them realize that you're not as scary as they thought. Um, so, play. Play with the animals. Play with children. And it'll give you stories to tell. But uh, there's another thing that happens in the eyes and in the mind of a child. They see the world with wonder. Things are new. And because they're new, they can spend time with the craziest thing. And so they, they play with bugs because the bugs are so wonderfully new. They may just repeatedly go back to the same rock or t a little rock and, and play with it. And, and when they learn to throw them, they'll throw them over and over and over. And they do the same things repeatedly because those things seem to have a sense of wonder. There's, they're almost miraculous. I still stop for flowers growing in the sidewalk. I'm still in wonder about the acrobatic skills of squirrels. <laughs> I watch the patterns of swirling water in small streams. I see wonder in little things. Now, as far as practicing this, um, as play, I, I have a discipline of play. And that discipline is to ride the shopping carts, or here in the UK, um, where I am at the moment, the shopping trolleys at the supermarket. On my way out, I run across the parking lot and ride them. Why? Because it's a practice of play, and I think of it as a discipline. And when I don't ride the shopping cart, I actually feel a little bit guilty, because... What? Am I afraid that somebody's going to look at me and think I'm weird? Come on now. <laughs> you know I'm weird. I mean, just look at me. Um, <laughs> so why not go for it all the way? Who's that long, gray, long bearded um, uh, man, this long gray bearded man riding the shopping cart? He's got to be insane. Well, that's fine. But my insanity is my creativity. And so practice play and practice um, seeing the world in wonder and stopping for things that most people think are inconsequential. We find that happens very naturally with the sunset because it's like the sky has been painted differently every night. And as the sun goes down, we see colors that we've not seen before and will never see again because that moment is unique. There is wonder in the world all around us and there's never a moment that it's not around us. You need to see it in people. And My second point for practices to develop creativity is what I call directed daydreaming. Um, Typically, daydreaming isn't necessarily thought of as a good practice. It's like a waste of time. But um, I believe that there can be a focused and directed daydreaming that helps us develop creativity, build that muscle of wild thought that we need for our writing. James Thurber's story about the secret life of Walter Mitty is an example of um, looking at daydreaming in a negative way. Uh, Walter Mitty's treated poorly and his daydreams end up badly. But let's face it, he's a lovable anti-hero within the book. And daydreaming has a place where we begin to um, imagine things that perhaps we hadn't thought of before. We let our mind run on thoughts and go places where it hasn't gone. Um, daydreaming can be a little bit like going on an adventure inside of our own heads. And so um, I'm going to um, give you an example of um, some daydreaming from one of my own books. So this is a segment from 
my book, Burning Religion. It's, it's a theology and philosophy book, but it's filled with segments that are fantasy tales, uh, somewhat in a grotesque medieval fashion. Um, they're called Tales from the Land of Jaw, The Adventures of Gwyn Ti. This is one of my favorite segments. Uh, it's called The Inquisition toward the end of the book. And the thing about Gwyn Ti that I was working on was I wanted to create a character that anybody could identify with, which meant that I could not identify whether Gwyn Di was male or female. And and so the name, um, it's it's a little more masculine, obviously. Gwyn is a, uh, a Welsh masculine name, but it's quite close to Gwen. And um, so anyway, in, in writing the book, uh, I had to avoid pronouns, anything that gave the identity way, and that was a bit of hard work to do that. But uh, here in this segment, I give an example of uh, the wild writing that it took me quite some time to come up with kooky ideas for. So here it is, uh, the Inquisition. Gwindy came to a fork in the road. It looked uncannily familiar. Gwindy read the dilapidated sign pointing down the hill to the village. It took a moment to realize where this was. Gwindy had traveled many months on the wide, wide road in search of the borders of the land of Jaw, only to discover that the wide, wide road led to a big circle, back to the beginning point of the long journey. Welcome to Kaminkinville. Gwindy flopped down in the middle of the road in despair and sat for hours, or maybe it was days. Perhaps it was weeks. The sun did not rise or set. It stood still, so it was impossible to tell how long a time had passed sitting there in the middle of the road. An occasional merchant or passing child walked in a wide arc around the despairing traveler and stared uncomfortably. Then, after some long, long time in the wide, wide road, chanting could be heard coming up the hill from Kaminkinville. Shambhala, Shambhala. And the repetitious Shambhalas came closer and closer, and Gwyn Di knew what was coming, but did not have the strength left to flee. Thirteen robed inquisitors processed up the hill, they formed a circle and surrounded Gwindi. The chief inquisitor in a bishop's robe carried a large hatchet. The hatcheteer took his hatchet and one by one pulled back the hoods of the twelve monks and chopped off their heads. He handed the heads of the monks back to them, and they stood calmly in the circle, spurting blood from their open necks and holding their own heads in their hands. Eerily they chanted with their disembodied heads. Shambhala, Shambhala. Suddenly the chanting stopped. The chief inquisitor, Hatcheteer, called out formally and coldly, We are here to account for your evil ways, Gwyn Di. All twelve beheaded monks began shouting. Their disembodied heads screamed high-pitched accusations. The blood spewed like small fountains from the overexcited pulsing arteries. From under the arm of the rather burly monk, his head cried, Heresy! Heresy! The petite blonde with a lion's mane of hair held her head in both hands and leaned forward, screaming, You're a friend of sinners, bewitched and filled with demons. I've seen you cavorting with the devil in my dreams. The twelve headless monks screamed accusations, danced in place in little hissy fits, and created a deep circle of blood around Gwindi. Their heads screamed and their bodies bled themselves out until they collapsed on the ground. The chief inquisitor, smiled with deep satisfaction. You are not welcome back until you have fully repented, heretic Gwyn Di. The hatcheteer then took each head, and one by one he pulled the top of the scalp cap over as though it was hinged, and set the open head upon the ground. 
hiking his bishop's robe up above his waist, he squatted and groaned and filled each head with a steaming, reeking pile. He closed the skull caps and placed the heads back on the bodies. Shambhala, Shambhala. The hatcheteer marched back to Kaminkinville as his chant faded slowly away. One by one, the bodies revived and followed the hatcheteer back to the village, chanting, leaving Gwyn Dee alone in a circle of blood. I think you've got my body, Shambhala. I thought it felt pretty nice, Shambhala. Hey, don't be touching it like that, Shambhala, Shambhala. Now my third point in developing creativity is this. You should practice the impossible. <laughs> And what I mean by that is that you should practice putting things together that don't seem like they belong together. Now, I used to do this live in performances when I would be playing my guitar um, at open mics. I would ask the audience to give me a couple topics that didn't belong together. And then I would make up a song on the spur of the moment about those two topics. And so I, I got crazy things that would come my way, like um, uh, octopuses and um, running through the forest. I, you know, people would, would give me all kinds of crazy ideas, and on the spur of the moment, I would come up with something, a rhyming, poetic, lyrical thing, as best as I could do about these two things going together. And it was usually fairly hilarious, probably more for me than for the audience. Uh, but this was a practice of putting things together that don't seem to belong together. That's the idea of things like absurdity and irony, and um, it comes to play so much in fantasy and in, in sci-fi because we're looking to create a, as it were, magical world. And a magical world is created by things that somehow end up together that don't belong together. Um, let me give you some examples from uh, a song of mine. I've been I've been writing uh, sonnets, and I'm trying to write as many sonnets as Shakespeare, which is 154 sonnets. I believe that's the number, and I'm probably 120 sonnets into doing it. But somewhere around sonnet number 43, I thought to myself, how on earth am I going to find enough topics to write so many sonnets? And so I thought, well, I'm going to write a sonnet that's like a pop song. Now, sonnet does mean little song, so that, that fits, but... But then again, the sonnet is a classic form of poetry with its iambic pentameter and 14 lines. And I, I thought um, the classic sonnet doesn't seem to fit pop songs. But I'm going to do that. Those two things don't seem to go together. But they go together well enough that it's not impossible. So let's up with the game a little bit more. What does not go with a sonnet pop song? about love, a pop love song, a sonnet about love. Let's throw in the apocalypse. So I was going to, I, I, I went about the task of writing a sonnet, pop love song, apocalyptic form of poetry. Somebody suggested I should call it a style of pop lips, but apocalyptic love songs, but that that's just, no, that's, that's just silly. Anyway, here it is. I, I came up with what has become one of my favorite songs that I have ever written. It's called um, Postponing Armageddon. Um, here's a bit of it. I want to count the stars
stars by firelight And we can number promises they make And we can call them yours and mine to take I feel I'm touching heaven in disguise Postponing I'm getting with your eyes I feel I'm touching heaven for a while Spoken Armageddon with your smile. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> so, you get the idea. I wrote a novella entitled Before We Saw Blue, and here's what I mean from the introduction, um, or the section of thank yous, here's what I mean by trying to merge the impossible. Uh, so I describe this impossible task in the introduction. This little novella was birthed in the friction of inspiration and perspiration. I'm not sure it will rise to meet Edison's definition for genius, but it will match his percentages. He said genius was 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. The inspiration came shortly after discovering that there was a literary contest in Wales open to Americans. Anything Welsh captures my attention and blows on the glowing embers of my heart, or hearth. Within a few hours, the integration of this rather complex fantasy, memoir, trail guide, dream, mythology fell into my little brain with some cohesion, title and all. Then came the perspiration. And so here is the first opening paragraphs of the book, Before We Saw Blue, sets the stage for the fantasy trail guide set of dreams that I personally had, etc., etc. Sheep grazed the sky. They meandered aimlessly toward the peak of Kater Idris. One's surroundings influence one's imagination. So in Wales, puffy little clouds always look like sheep. It seemed appropriate that sheep would graze the sky here. The line between blue and green is blurred in the old language. Glass is blue, and glass is green like the sea. And gwyrd is green like grass, and gwyrd is blue, too. One might forgive the sheep for eating the sky. I grew up in paradise, but there were no sheep in Southern California, so the sky was always blue. The sun was warm most of the year, and the land was brown where the deserts ran into the sea. Here in North Wales, the land was green, because the sheep have eaten the blue out of the sky, leaving the wild, gray sea to fall upon the verdant hills. I pulled my pack onto my shoulders and looked up toward the southeast. The peak of Kater Idris snarled at the oncoming sheep. It was deep into winter and the land was still greener than the home of my youth, but today was a blue day in Wales. The sun shone brightly and warmed my face in gentle rebellion against the cold. My friends warned me about these rugged mountains. Rescue teams are often called to save the foolish lost and injured hikers from its dangerous craggy sides. All summer long the rescue teams are busy, but in winter one might be lost for quite some time. Despite the warnings of my friends, I was going alone. There are dangers darker than the falling rock or the loosened ledges on a cliff. Dangers that must be faced alone. I was going to take a one-way trip. I had come to slay a giant, and was not coming down until his body lay lifeless in the snow on that toothy peak. So, purposely practicing ways to combine things that don't belong together is in a sense like doing the impossible. And the more you practice that kind of thing, the more you do something that typically people call thinking outside the box. Um, why have any boxes? Let's just break them all down and make some new rules. Isn't that what fantasy 
sci-fi is all about is creating worlds of new rules and somehow still making them seem believable enough that as you read the story you're transported into this weird and wonderful place. Why have any boxes? Let's just break them all down and make some new rules. Isn't that what fantasy sci-fi is all about? Is creating worlds of new rules and somehow still making them seem believable enough that as you read the story you're transported into this weird and wonderful place. So uh, practice mixing things that don't belong together, randomly so, and it will work a muscle that causes you to do that even on the spur of the moment. Um, sometimes I say that I'm a stupid idea minute, um, <laughs> but that on the other hand is my benefit, and it's why I'm writing anywhere from seven to nine different books at the same time and one of them comes forward that I have to complete because of events that are coming up or um, maybe the ideas coalesce together strong enough in in order for me to feel like I can finish something I've started. So anyway, those are my three points for developing your creativity. Number one, Act like a child. Play. Two, daydream directively. A directive daydreaming is a practice that will take you places adventure like you've never been before. Number three, um, practice putting things together that don't belong together. It's like trying to perform the impossible. And that's what creativity really is. Okay, so now for the turn in this um, video, this podcast. Um, this is where we go spiritual and we take the three points on developing creativity and apply it to our spiritual lives. So for those of you who don't like this stuff, you can turn it off now, that's okay. Or you can jump ahead to the end to see some of the cool things that are at the end of the video. But here we go. Spirituality and lessons on creativity and how they fit together. So the first, um, first point was that we should um, be like a child. Now, this one has so much obvious connection to Christian spirituality that almost goes without saying that it fits. Um, Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew uh, chapter 18 verse 3, except you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, say what? <laughs> Now, the King James utilizes the terminology, unless you are converted and become like children. People are really afraid of this word, converted. It's viewed, the word convert, and all its cognates, conversion, converted, converting, they're all looked at in such a negative uh, way because it's perceived that we're trying to persuade you with force to become like us. When I look at it from the context of the way Jesus utilizes this concept of converting and becoming like something else, um, he's actually asking us to be converted to wildness. The wildness of a child. The craziness of a kid. There's a reason I utilize the term wild theology for my own theology, because I think it's wilder than we've been told. And, and here's evidence 
from the teachings of Jesus that shows us that. So, number one, becoming like a child gives us a kind of freedom and a kind of wildness that makes life just a little bit more worth living. Um, and, you know, children don't care if they look weird when they do something. Imagine if we could be like that. We didn't care what somebody thought about us when we did something weird. That'd be so liberating. Oh my gosh. Um, then um, there was the point about daydreaming. Now I think daydreaming relates to spirituality very strongly. I have something I practice which I call redemptive imagination. Redemptive imagination is the ability to see your troubles in the light of the miraculous biblical stories where impossible situations are turned for the better. Things like Joseph's long imprisonment in Egypt and eventually it turns around and he becomes ruler of the land. Or the long years of wandering in the wilderness and the children of Israel in those 40 years are experiencing all sorts of struggle but eventually it leads to the promised land. Can you see your own life and its struggles in the light of such stories as this? If you can, then in a sense what you're doing is you're daydreaming. You're dreaming with um, dreams of faith and hope and it's this faith and hope that keeps your chin up when your circumstances are down. Um, so daydreaming in a way that causes you to see the, as Joseph Campbell would, would put it, the heroic myth. You can see your own life in that kind of story. Then um, you're, you're going to be a more positive person for it. And so whether it's Christian spirituality or any other spirituality, we know that hope has power. And that hope um, can be... Uh, life-changing for us. Um, and my, my, my last point of developing creativity was to practice the impossible or to put things together that do not belong together. Now this is something I've worked with for decades now. I've worked with people from other religions and other political persuasions, other classes, um, for decades. I've traveled with hippies and rubber tramps and dirty kids. I've uh, of course you look at me and you go, of course you have. You look like you're one of them. Um, <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose I am. <laughs> um, I've gathered with pagans and witches, with Muslims and Buddhists, um, and people from various walks of life. And it has been my goal to develop a lasting friendships, lasting relationships um, with people from these different walks of life. And I do that because I think that's what Jesus would do. I was so much unlike Jesus, and yet he sought to be my friend. And um, as a note, befriending is not the same thing as agreeing. I have strong disagreement with the politics of um, separation that are going on today, that when somebody is different than myself in some radical way that I should ostracize them and separate myself from them, perhaps and try to embarrass them publicly um, because I think they don't belong in society. Well, the fact of the matter is they are in society and my proximity to them is my ability to influence them. And my proximity to them is my ability to influence them. When I separate myself from other people, I make myself unable to be a persuader of that person I disagree with. So I prefer to lovingly disagree instead of um, disagreeing in a way that is separating and 
um, polarizing. Um, so these are some of the points of why um, the same practices of creating, um, of, of, of becoming creative thinkers are positive practices for our spirituality. And I want to say something about that last point. So in terms of trying to put people together who radically disagree, um, I'm part of a group called Multi-Faith Matters, and that's a group of Christian leaders, um, three pastors and three academics who have been working on getting evangelical Christians to connect with people of other faith in positive and redemptive ways, um, in loving ways. And we're going to be holding a conference, a short gathering really, conference isn't quite the word for it, it's a gathering of people, um, in uh, this coming year, May 6th through 8th in 2020, in Austin, Texas. And you can go to multifaithmatters.org and you'll find out how to connect with us and perhaps join us for that time together in Austin, Texas. I'd love to see you because there's not enough of us doing this kind of work. So anyway, this is Phil Moyman checking out on Wild Theology and uh, hopefully if you're a writer this has meant something to you and if you are a spiritual person who's seeking to develop your spirituality deeper you've learned something from this podcast as well and to all my uh, uh, supporters um, those on patreon and those who have uh, supported my travels thank you so much I cannot thank you enough God bless This has been the Wild Theology Podcast by me, Phil Wyman. And if you'd like to support this project, well, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Thanks for checking in.